Um, so you can let me turn to you on this question. So Connie's just described the sort of social situation within the university structure. How do you see AI mirroring or maybe amplifying the kind of social structure that Connie just described? All right. Well, first of all, I'm really happy to be here. Um, thank you so much for inviting me as well. And um, I'd say that um, the ways in which um, AI mirrors societal structures is uh, in various ways, obviously, but um, the ways that I think comes very clearly and naturally to see is when we look at robotics, um, how uh, there's gendered representation of robotics. I'll give you a quick funny example. Right around the time that we were putting our proposal together, one of the national railroad companies decided to put an information kiosk and there was a, a man and a woman um, who were supposed to be giving us information. The man was a, a, a human man and the woman was an animated woman who was um, programmed to answer rather sexist comments and questions. And so that's the, that's the default in the national uh, railroad system or the former and formerly national railroad system. There's, then there's a lot for us to go. Um, there's also gender-based violence in um, video games, and also I might also say that uh, just in terms of um, like if we're thinking about the future of the metaverse, then it's quite easy to imagine that what we experience today is going in, in our real lives is going to have an impact on the way that metaverse is going to be um, created globally. So these are probably just a few things that I can think of in terms of. Um, societal structures being uh, what kind of is imprinted by uh, AI. Really interesting. So Amy, let me ask you, because um, um, Yuko's talking about the uh, the violent character of online um, communication and experience. And unfortunately, you yourself have recently been the target of gendered and masculine commentary on social media. Um, for commenting on uh, events around Japanese history, wartime history in particular. Do you think, I mean, first of all, I'm really sorry that that happened to you. Um, and I just wonder if you could, as you've reflected on that experience, whether you think that the media of Twitter and the internet and all of that had any impact on the way the comments developed were aggregated, shared, et cetera. Yes, um, thank you for that question, um, and I am also delighted to be here in the company of people who do such interesting work um, in ways that intersects with my own in um, unexpectedly. Um, so yes, I am a historian, um, and I recently um, produced a research report that had to do with the quote-unquote comfort women who were forced to serve the Japanese military during World War II. And I think partly because of social media, we now exist in a world where scholarship that's not necessarily intended for a vast public audience only lasts maybe half a second in this world of scholarship before it ends up all over the place. Um, and that all over the place on Twitter brings you into contact with a lot of people that you don't necessarily want to be talking to. Um, and so in my case, um, it created a lot of um, harassment from at first, Japanese nationalists who really do not want to see foreigners discussing, especially Americans discussing the history of comfort women. But what's interesting is, um, first of all, that this harassment came from a few kind of strategically located accounts with a lot of followers. And they would kind of ramp up harassment, these few people, by posting many times a day with my name and my handle. And that would cause all of their followers to swarm. But what was interesting to me about that experience was it wasn't just Japanese nationalists. In fact, these circles of kind of Japanese nationalists intersected with people who were just anti-feminist for some reason. And the Japanese nationalists are very anti-feminist in general. Femi to them is a short name for feminist. It's a discriminatory term. They were calling me that. But also people who like anime, like Americans who were really into anime, who also were anti-feminist came in. Um, also, random anti-Semites um, who kind of heard about this. Also, it was an interesting way in which all of these nationalist circles don't stay within the national sphere, but they kind of intersect with other groups in other places. That said, though, the same qualities that allowed this swarming to take place brought me into contact with Japanese scholars and also Japanese feminists who were extremely active online. 
And I think the flip side of this terrible experience was I got to meet many wonderful people, at least one of whom is in the audience, um, and was able to expand my scholarly connections and connections to feminists in Japan. So it really was a double-edged sword. Super interesting. I'm sure there'll be more questions about that. Um, hey, I'd like to ask you a question about your perspective as a creator of, of new technologies. Do you see the creation side of the field as gendered in any way? How, what is your experience there? Yeah, it's actually, um, I, I don't have, a, I used to have a, the perspective that there was a, a counterbalance of more men than women. Um, but since I started finding my own spaces, um, I exist now kind of in the like creative community. Uh, we have a lot of people doing fiber, like generative fiber arts, a lot of people doing generative weaving, generative sewing, generative crochet. Um, we have people doing different Wait, types. what is that? You know, oh, so uh, generative, generative means, um, so if you've ever uh, like woven a pattern, you know that you can have a simple rule of like alternating uh, one row and then another row, you get emerging patterns out of that. And so the, the concept of generativity is saying, okay, we've also got, uh, code that we can write uh, to kind of create emerging patterns. Uh, the phrase that I really like from this from scholar Michael Cook is make something that makes something. So you're making something that kind of uh, on its own comes to life and makes often uh, garbage stuff in a delightful way. <laughs> and so it's not always about quality, it's about kind of watching this little uh, creation come to life and emerge and grow like a garden. Um, and that actually, you know, it's been interesting because I've seen uh, the number, like as I kind of find my own space, I see the number with, of women rise and rise. So when you're within kind of a structured space that says this is officially AI, this is officially computer science, uh, if there are walls around it, the people who pass through those walls are the people, well, often just the people who feel like they have permission to pass those walls. And that could be the few women who say like, I have, like, I'm going to see this permission. And then all the men who feel kind of explicit permission. Um, and then if you have a space that doesn't have those walls or has a different kind of permission, people will just end up there. Uh, so I often tell my students that departments are fictional. They mostly exist to kind of deal with funding. Uh, and there's no problem that is obligated to stay within the space of computer science or any other field. And so I wandered freely across fields. And so I simply kind of often don't notice when I've wandered out of computer science walls uh, and into other fields, uh, except that the gender gets really wibbly. <laughs> That's great. Well, let me just ask all of you, I mean, Kauri mentioned the specific cha challenges of empowering LGBTQI plus communities. Um, do, does anyone have any thoughts about the specific challenges that around those communities when it comes to AI? I can say something about this that I've noticed on Twitter by following a lot of both American and Japanese accounts, which is the way that um, issues of gender in the United States that will kind of come up in right wing, especially discourse, start also coming up in Japanese discourse because these communities are related. And so when you started seeing a lot of kind of negative commentary, discriminatory language and um, harassment of transgender people in the United States start up on Twitter, that moved very easily, and I think it was directional from the United States to Japan into the Japanese sphere, so that the same people who, you know, hated feminists, femi, were also starting to publish a lot more transgender, um, anti-transgender, anti-trans hate content. And so it's interesting that these, you know, both positive social movements that come up in one place will spread to another place, like the Me Too movement and hashtag, but also these kind of negative discriminatory dark strains um, that, that specifically focus on LGBTQ people also travel transnationally through the medium of social media. I could just add to that. So um, I think um, in terms of uh, facial recognition systems that exist, there's, the default is still a binary, right? So um, um, when transgender people go want to uh, go to another country, for example, at the airport, immigration control, it's often a tricky situation. If they actually want to um, uh, migrants to another country, the asylum um, seeking uh, applications might make it really tricky for them as well. So definitely there's a lot of challenges for LGBTQ people for sure. Fascinating. 
All right, so let's talk now a little bit about possible responses. So, Kauri, you're the founder of this amazing program, the BAI Global Forum. Can you describe a little bit about what the purpose of this project is and um, what kind of work it's doing? Yes, um, I've, I've been a scholar of media and journalism studies, and uh, I study a lot about uh, women's representation in the media and also how uh, news uh, treated women or what kind of or who are behind the news and who select who select the news what we see every day so that that's been my theme for a long time but nowadays we talk a lot about data not any more news or not any more drama so all of the bits of data that we get, and people get their data with this <laughs> every day. <laughs> and you just check news, or you just check your information. And I came to think about, OK, everybody has individual information. And uh, behind this machine, I heard that there's a lot of AI what's going on. So, and now I'm interested in gender and in feminism and so on. So what will be the consequence of our daily lives about the information intakes, for example? How, how, what are we exposed to every day? And uh, so I thought, okay, maybe, uh, and then we have this uh, big, uh, so to say, project, uh, in, in, with regard to the AI. So I applied for this funding uh, specifically for gender and AI. And we have this big uh, project called the Beyond AI project. And uh, among many projects going on in, inside this project, we are the only humanity and social, uh, social science people. Uh, Others are all engineers and also biologists, uh, brains, researchers, and so on. But Yuko and I uh, applied for this big uh, funding. We want to do this AI and uh, gender uh, to explore what it means to women uh, in, at the time at the age of information, uh, digital information. And so we got it. And after we had a meeting with other people, we found out that we are only humanities and social science people and we were only women. So that was something in particular. <laughs> so, yes, uh, and what I wanted to add to your comment and was that for me, yes, uh, digital information is uh, very, equivalent to women can, uh, in one aspect it is uh, empowering our women to connect to each other and have more uh, uh, power because you can connect to the social workers for the United States and I, and I have many Chinese students and they you know, they particularly say that they can connect to Chinese students in the United States and so that they can also um, bring their uh, feminism forward even they are in, in, in China, right? So it's not very empowering, but on the other hand, uh, digital information is also very brutal to women, right? We have experience and also I, I myself also had, uh, was, was involved in the uh, uh, women's issue and I was also uh, attacked by, uh, by people and also, um, Many of my colleagues, uh, they, when they actively tweet, uh, they were attacked and also threatened with them. And I came to think sometimes the dark side is now going more rather than this positive side uh, because of this attention economy that people get, that those who get more attention win. And uh, yeah, so, so I think the gender pers perspective for us, for example, for the uh, BAI Global Forum is very, I believe it is very important 
keep our eyes on gender and minority issues, especially at the time of digital digitization. Yeah. Well, Yuko, you're the now the director of the BAI uh, Global Forum, and you've talked a lot about the need for what you call critical studies of AI. So what do you mean by critical studies of AI? What does this look like? Right. So um, critical AI studies is something that I think um, needs to happen. And this is resonating a lot with what I read about my, uh, This resonates a lot with what Kate mentioned earlier about being able to freely, freely move uh, from one discipline to another. And um, so the ultimate goal of the Global Forum is to create a forum uh, and a global forum where lot of multi-stakeholders can basically have a conversation about AI, not just in terms of being a proponent of AI. And of course, we're not being deniers or trying to block the feet of AI. We just want to find good ways to make uh, to use AI for um, to make the society inclusive. So um, to meet that goal, there's a lot of work that's already been done about um, that would fall under critical AI. Um, studies in the sense that um, we have a book club and we read every month uh, really interesting work, primarily from the US and primarily in English. Um, but they're all scattered across different disciplines, like technology, um, literature, um, politics, they're all different um, places. So the idea is that to create a name for the kind of work that is being done and create a space. And that's what I think what we're, we're talking about. If we create a safe space, for this kind of critical AI that needs to happen, then that permits everybody to have this conversation. Um, it also allows people to have um, uh, uh, perhaps not just funding and also institutional support, but also just clout towards the AI industry and um, just have a better kind of um, sense of uh, awareness. We can plant more awareness to the public as well. So that's generally what we're trying to do with critical AI studies. Now, how is it different from other similar disciplines like digital humanities um, and all these uh, media, feminist media studies? Um, I think the idea of critical AI studies would be that we're really trying to have an impact on AI development as we speak. So there's an urgency there. And also there's um, the kind of unpredictable nature. Like we don't really know what's going to happen with AI. So um, how do we... Um, learn from the history that we have about technology and its relationship to society. And so re using all of the resources that we have and using the hindsight that we have to actually um, come up with a good way to use AI is basically the outlook that we have. Well, Amy, I want to, you just mentioned history, so I'm going to ask you, as a historian, um, you know, you've written about how, you know, you were doing your historical work and the hashtag Me Too movement happened and that influenced the way you thought about history. I'm interested if you could, do you have any thoughts about the reverse also of how, what you know about the history of technological change in Japan and elsewhere might inform how we should be thinking about this change happening in real time these days? Yeah, so um, it's a very, it's a kind of a very complicated set of questions. Um, I will say that um, as for kind of the hashtag and, you know, hashtags and algorithms kind of go together. So there's an AI component there um, to kind of um, influencing the way that I reinterpreted my work. I was um, doing research on a 19th century woman named Sumeno who ran away from home in 1839 and went to the big city of Edo, which is now Tokyo. Um, and along the way, she was accompanied by this man who was named Chikan. And if you speak Japanese, the fact that the man is named Chikan is kind of funny because Chikan is what we call people who broke people on the train. Um, <laughs> but this guy was actually named Chikan. And in her um, letters home about this man, first she said that he was wonderful and he was a friend to her and he guided her to Edo and it was wonderful. And then her story started to change. And he said that while they were on the road, basically uh, he started pressuring me to marry him and he had threatened to abandon me on the road and I had no choice but to do what he said. So as a historian, I read this as an oblique reference to sexual assault. But before the Me Too movement really changed my thinking about sexual assault and the way that women talk about it, um, I was always very careful to say, but she might have been lying. She had reasons to lie. She had reasons to represent it this way to her brother. So it didn't seem as if it were her idea. 
Um, but when I saw the kind of hashtag and believe women trending and watched all these women tell their own stories about sexual assault and change their stories and explain why their stories had changed, it made me think about um, what we call kind of epistemic injustice, like whose stories do we believe and whose stories do we not believe? And that's what the believe women hashtag was really trying to say. It wasn't saying believe all women because they never lie. That's ridiculous. Sometimes women lie. Um, and I think that's one of the dangers actually of hashtag activism is you end up with these slogans that can be very easily misinterpreted because they're oversimplified. Um, but through thinking about that, I really changed how I presented that, that um, incident that came up in my research. About the reverse, um, how technology in women's lives has changed the kind of balance between genders, I tend to be somewhat pessimistic. Um, and I am really influenced by the work of a medieval historian named Judith Bennett, who wrote about what she calls a patriarchal equilibrium. She says women will sometimes make progress in some realms because of technological change. And here she was talking about actual brewing here in medieval Europe. Um, but in fact, they always kind of return to an equilibrium in which progress in one realm is kind of balanced out by backsliding in another one. And her example was, if you look at women's wages, that 70% is really consistent through time. No matter how much technology liberated women from housework or allowed them to control their fertility, we still seem to have this ceiling. So in that sense, I'm hopeful that we can transform this um, outcome. But history shows that you make progress in one domain, sometimes you backslide in another. Interesting. Maybe technology is not enough to defeat more other type of uh, innovation rather than only technology. Like that mm -hmm. takes a lot of energy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> energy. That's the more, more than technological mm -hmm. energy. Mm -hmm. um, well, Kate, I mean, you're the creator here. So you've contributed to a whole bunch of projects on gender from gendered voice assistance um, to a gender of the day Twitter bot. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about some of the forays you've made into the space and how you're thinking about what technology and creative work can do in the space? Yeah, so the gender of the day bot is not mine. Uh, I'm what's known as the grandmother of bots on Twitter. So I made a tool called Tracery uh, that uh, allows anybody, I taught it to poets and third graders and uh, the theater department at Northwestern. Um, and so anybody can make their own kind of, uh, if you've ever played Mad Libs, which I don't know if the Japanese members have ever, like if, that gets, if that's just an American reference, but it's like Mad Libs for computers and you can kind of write your own Mad Libs. Um, and it's fun because you can kind of, um, with this Mad Lib, you put in all your own rules. So you're saying, uh, often the kind of argument when people make their bots implicitly is, uh, I'm going to put all of these different concepts into a blender, and then whatever comes out, kind of this shuffle, a recombinatorial uh, version of what I put in is kind of valid. And so the, I really love the gender of the day bot because it says, look, let's kind of explode the concept of gender. The bots have no preconceptions. So these bots are what's called context-free grammars, which means they're not doing the statistical Let's uh, look at a lot of data and try to average the correct answer out of data. They have no memory except for the words that you put in. And so if you put in that today, like the options for gender are like chair and desk mat and the color pink, you, it will just say like today gender is the color pink. And so you can kind of put in as many nouns and objects and emotions as you want. And so it allows somebody, whoever made this, and I don't actually remember who made it, um, there's 16,000 bots running this technology. Um, so I, I love all my grandchildren. They're all beautiful and talented. Um, <laughs> but uh, certainly gender of the day is making this argument that like gender can be truly alien and it can also serve to kind of push us outside of our expectations. And so it's really wonderful to see some of these bots. Um, there's another one that uh, takes two emoji and makes a little DNA strand out of them. It's like, okay, uh, today's, uh, today's DNA is uh, swords and hearts intertwining or wine and mouse, uh, and let's, you know, just some of these are great and some of these aren't. It's really wonderful on Twitter because then somebody can see something truly surreal made by a computer that has no concept of what it's made and say like, oh my God, this gets me in some, some sort of deep way that only surrealism can sometimes get us. Uh, so sometimes if, if you take security camera footage of somebody, is that the most true version of them? Or is sometimes just a strange little emoji juxtaposition that feels like it's capturing something that we couldn't 
name before gender of the day described our gender as you know an empty coffee cup sitting on a table in the wind. <laughs> Great. Um, so, okay, so um, Kate just mentioned Mad Libs, and I, I don't know. Does Mad Libs translate? Do you know what she's talking about? You have no idea. Okay, good. We'll play at dinner. Well, <laughs> well that, that, that points my question, which is about the cultural specificity of some of this work. Um, so, Yuko, in the Beyond AI project, do you think at all about how AI is being shaped differently in different cultural contexts. Do you see a difference? You were talking about reading American texts or the things that don't fit to the Japanese context. What would you say about that? Yes, so um, when it comes to AI development, we all know that the US is a big center. We also know that China is a big center. And we also, in terms of development and implementation, we also know that um, EU, the European Union, is a big player when it comes to regulation. regulation. And so what does that mean in terms of how AI is being developed? Um, there's an interesting thing about, um, of course, there's a lot of defense money that goes into AI development, but also I think what's unique about, uh, or maybe not unique, but characteristic about AI development is that it's led by industry at all right now. And so what about the, the, the non-big players? What, what about the rest of us in the Asia Pacific or in Africa? And uh, what are we getting out of this? And I think if you look at a, an international comparison that um, came out earlier this year, and it was comparing 28 countries, about 20,000 people who responded to the survey, you'll see patterns about um, what they think um, can, what they think AI can do in society, and what kind of improvements that it can bring. And the survey was about 14 different categories of like education, income, freedom, uh, and legal rights. And you can definitely see patterns. Uh, US and uh, Europe, European countries have similar kind of reaction in the sense that they're not as positive or they're not as optimistic about the outlook. Um, people in, uh, in uh, Latin America and uh, had a similar kind of idea about it being very optimistic, they being very optimistic about what kind of changes it can bring. And then there's kind of this interesting kind of um, third place in a way where Japan kind of sits, where it's a kind of a mixture of both. And um, so it'd be really interesting. And this, this particular example might shed some light. So if you look at how optimistic are you uh, in terms of freedom and legal rights and what AI can bring to that. Um, the uh, India, China, and a lot of the Latin American countries were very optimistic, something like 70%, whereas in the European countries in America, it was in the teens, like 17%, something like that. So very big disparity. And so, um, and Japan was about 40, 50%. It was not quite, they hadn't quite made up their mind. I think. So um, if we look at the geopolitics, I think it's really important to, to look at it in order to understand what kind of regulations are uh, being put in place. A lot of the regulations that are currently being discussed is very Eurocentric. And so, um, but sometimes people have different views about privacy, for example. I think we all agree that AI ethics is important, but if you look at the individual components of which ones are more prioritized versus others, that's when it gets a little bit tricky and when the, the values are in contention with each other. Also, you know, we need to kind of figure out the details um, by region and by the history that we have. And um, so I think there's, um, there's definitely uh, an importance to pay attention to the regional differences when it comes to AI implementation and what it's serving. I've actually got kind of an interesting thought because you, when you were describing which countries are optimistic and which countries aren't, I noticed that the countries that are not optimistic are the ones that already have a lot of capital, and the ones that are not are the ones that have very little capital. And this tracks a lot of what I've seen kind of when I talk to people. So uh, I do a ton of AI outreach. Um, so that's like my kind of primary mission in life. Northwestern pays me, but sometimes I teach Northwestern students, but mostly I teach everyone on Twitter. Um, so I get a lot of like foreign people or like non-Americans uh, that I talk to. And, um, a lot of people from very rural or kind of non, non-technologically famous areas. So I was recently giving a talk in Crete. Uh, so Crete is not a super populous area. 
of grace. It's not technologically, it's not the Silicon Valley of anything. Um, and so they were all very excited that like they could talk to experts in AI around the world. Um, you could have a technology startup in Crete on your family's farm with no capital. Uh, and so this uh, kind of the promise of, and there's certain things that you have had a lot of capital to do in AI, to train these giant systems. Um, but once the giant systems are trained, we're seeing like a lot of things in AI is actually just figuring out how to use it for different purposes. So there's kind of a, an implicit promise that anybody around the world who doesn't belong to any organization, who has not gone to university, who has not been let into any gates, um, has found enough resources to train themselves up enough to do something and seen some local problem that they think that they can fix, there's at least the promise out there that then they can kind of gain the same sort of commercial and societal recognition that you get in Silicon Valley. Whether or not it's a true promise, but at least that's, I think, I wonder if that's one of the promises that we're seeing. And from the other side, I can't say, oh, in Silicon Valley, I'm excited to become Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley. All I can see is what I stand to lose. So all I can see is the, the freedoms that I can stand to lose. I can see how much more I'm being tracked than I was being tracked before. So maybe that's where some of that perspective comes from, just from the people that I've talked to. Right, and also just in terms of that global perspective, which is really important, the technology travels quite easily because it's led by industry, not by defense. Um, so that means by national uh, interest. So that means that, for example, uh, facial recognition systems in, from made in China, a lot of them are used in South Africa. Um, there's a Japanese electronic company that actually uh, serves, uh, provides uh, biometric information systems to at least a third of the U.S. law enforcement. A Japanese company doing this as well. So, um, so there's a lot of kind of transnational, kind of international, kind of geopolitics that makes sense. Very interesting. Okay, let's open it up to questions. So, uh, if you have a question, you're in the room. Please raise your hand. If you're online, just put it in the chat. Someone will bring it up. Any questions? Comments? Yeah, please. Could you identify yourself, please? Oh, yeah, I'm Paul Christensen, um, former professor here at Northwestern. Um, I would like to just learn more about some of the actual application. We just started getting into them in the last couple of minutes. But some of the actual AI applications that you think are uh, having a positive and negative influence, um, not necessarily social media, I, you know, what's happening on Twitter and you know, Twitter and Elon, but, <laughs> but, um, but I would like so to actually answer that question with relevance to what happens on Twitter, because one of the AI things that I think has been really transformative is translation, um, it's like automatic translation. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of creating an illusion of borderlessness and seamlessness in which information is supposed to be traveling really quickly and seamlessly so that somebody doesn't speak the language can automatically translate it. And in fact, just because you've automatically translated it does not mean you understand it, but it gives people access that they think they're missing. Um, and so by creating this kind of frictionlessness, it accelerates the pace of the misinformation that flies around. So that's well, what it is. You said something earlier that I, I don't understand, but you said that there's AI behind the hashtags on Twitter. What, do you, what did you mean by algorithms? Algorithms. Yeah. So that's what you see? That's what Twitter serves up on your daily? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Response to specific applications, right? Is this your question? Like, so yeah, yeah. Examples. We got into, for example, the Japanese company that's serving a third of the police department. Yeah. Right? It goes up on the on the uh, uh, timeline. The algorithm uh, tunes to the uh, for for even visual timeline. Uh, uh, calls, uh, if if some good attention comes uh, on certain hashtag, it always comes uh, on the timeline up higher up so that everybody sees it and. Because everybody sees it, they become cause more to the, to the mm -hmm. higher up on the timeline. So it accelerates the attention mm -hmm. economy. And that's how it works with the algorithm. That's how I learned. Is it right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, the algorithm could be so this is just for the particular algorithm that ought to be very easy. It's like, okay, um, how many times are people using the hashtag? Yeah. We'll just sort those numbers and put them once at the top. But then you can say, okay, this person is posting from Stockholm. Uh, how far should we look outside of Stockholm to see maybe there's some certain things that are trending just in their area? 
okay, this person has had a lot of posts about electronics. Should we surface the hashtags to them that are posting about electronics? And so then you get into a lot of these kind of grouping and clustering algorithms. And uh, when I asked people online this morning of like how did uh, generative AI impact their lives, a lot of them were talking about this kind of like prediction uh, and then the both delight and damage of being either classified correctly or classified incorrectly. Uh, so for, for something to, uh, so I, I am constantly at war with my algorithm because I have two very high value characteristics. One is unmarried female and the other one is tech founder. Uh, and it's really fun for me to post back and forth, like sum it up a little bit, post about JavaScript and like see them cut over who thinks that they have a better ownership over who I am. Um, so that's kind of just a sport you can play. Um, I would like to answer like the, the initial question of like, what are some interesting things? So um, AI, uh, especially deep learning, machine learning that we're seeing now, the TL, like I'm happy to go over this with anybody. Um, the TLDR is, uh, it is always statistical systems. So you are feeding in a bunch of data and then you're trying to predict the outcome. Um, and if you have a lot of data and then you have what's called labels, you can predict statistical mapping. So if I say like, okay, there's a, you know, 20% chance that somebody who's over five foot nine plays basketball, I can say, okay, I can like maybe learn a correlation. And you can imagine how often that's wrong, which is most of the time I suppose people don't play professional basketball, but I can imagine like learning some relationship. Uh, and then the more date, like different axes you have, the more complicated it is to learn that relationship. And then you can also have these kind of neat models where you can store more and more complex machinery and relationships, but it's always just making a statistical prediction based on some numbers go in and some numbers come out. How are we going to, it's always some numbers go in, some numbers come out. So anytime you have like, I want to do something on an image, I want to do something on text, it always has to convert that into numbers. Um, but uh, so we see a lot of interesting things happen when we're trying to like learn on things that humans can understand. Uh, and that we think that we know the right answer to. But one of the really like wonderful things is that it's great on things that humans don't understand at all. So the first thing that was really pop like that really worked with this was um, when you write a number, it was able to predict the number and it was able to like read checks in the 80s. Uh, so if you like wrote in the post office use this. So like you write an address on a letter in 1985, it gets read by a very rudimentary neural network uh, from way back when, and it's able to detect you wrote a four. Um, even though you couldn't probably write out yourself the rules for what makes a four. Um, and then the second thing, which I think is relevant to this panel, is uh, breast cancer detection was the second big thing that went on. Because it turns out breast cancer, if you take a biopsy, it's just a big kind of gray and black noisy field. Uh, and you can send somebody to oncology school for five years and they can then stare at that like fuzzy thing and be like, ah, I think that's cancer. Um, but the computer doesn't actually know that this is any part of a problem than looking at the number four and finding out that that's a four. And so it's really great at things that humans just can't, we don't have words for, we don't have logic for, but we still wanna know. Um, so, you know, it's been fantastic for medical stuff because medical stuff has no obligation to be knowable by humans. Um, and often is uh, anytime you can like turn medical stuff into words that we can track, it's often incorrect. Um, but you know, like the computers are really good at that sort of fuzziness. And so we're seeing it used kind of invisibly in a lot of things that people don't understand enough to get upset with, sometimes for good reasons and sometimes for bad reasons, about making these predictions based on data from across an entire population, data from across your body. Um, I wear one of these little fitness tracking rings. Um, it's probably trying to do possibly some bad data science on a bunch of different things about my body. Oh, it tries to predict, uh, um, predict my period, which is interesting. I'm going to see like what it's trying to read and how much it thinks. And it hedges its bets a lot with that. It's like, oh, well, we probably can't really predict it, but we're going to try. Um, so a lot of this kind of, <clears throat> there's going to be some wonderful stuff in just being able to do data science that we've never been able to do before, um, accessible by more kinds of people, and on problems that maybe uh, Silicon Valley didn't turn their attention to. But because anybody has access to these tools, if there's somebody that something that somebody in rural Creek thinks is important, or somebody with a particular medical condition thinks is important, they can start running this data science themselves. Well, yes, I have a couple yeah. of things as well. So um, the AI translation, for sure, it can have negative effects as well. But I think in some ways, it could have a very positive effect. If you know, like we look at the language that is being used in, on the internet, 
um, it's primarily English um, and then maybe Chinese, but um, by having AI translation systems and DAO is quite good now. So um, it could actually serve a lot of populations in terms of accessing information. Mm -hmm. The second thing I might say is um, uh, some of you probably have read Invisible Women by you know, Caroline Beato Perez, um, but she writes a lot about how there's uh, uh, gender-based uh, data missing in a lot of the uh, ways in which algorithms are set up. And so um, there's definitely um, marginalized populations that, can, that need to be addressed in terms of AI algorithm development. And one really positive one would be indigenous AI, which is where um, basically um, data sovereignty belongs toward or, or uh, Native, uh, American, Native uh, Americans are using uh, uh, their own network to create uh, data sovereignty. And so um, basically what the U.S. government has done is that they've been very kind of scarce, uh, scarce about collecting data about um, the community and therefore any kind of prediction that is being made is not very good, it's not very accurate. So um, they're trying to uh, build their own database and also um, use it for, like, for example, protecting their lands in terms of like figuring out what kind of biodiversity they need to address at this particular moment. And so there's that kind of way in which it's being used for work. Well, actually, this is a, a question from one of our online participants. Um, um, says, from the stories Amy's brought to us, it seems like AI has exasperated a lot of injustices, but can Kate give us any more examples of how scholars and artists and programmers are pushing us to more AI gender equality? So what would you say? Uh, more gender AI equality. And again, I'm just, I'm more in the weird side, but I mostly catch all the stuff happening in the medical side and the political side from other folks. Um, you know, I can, uh, honestly, I think for me, um, certainly data, uh, being able to control your own data, to have groups of people that can own their own sets of data, to collect their own sets of data, um, basically like, can you, if data is capital, can it be owned by the people who should be owning it rather than are owned by others? Um, and we're seeing, not enough of that. Um, although I'm excited for things like you know having AI expertise that are explicitly saying like we are going to try to, to do this. Um, you see people like Janelle Shane. So um, if you follow uh, one one name from today, Janelle Shane is really great. Uh, she does um, kind of playful interactions with AI, uh, often to sometimes for playful purposes and sometimes for serious purposes. Uh, so she's kind of like the the gesture of poking fun and revealing the foibles. Uh, so she gave a really interesting presentation recently about uh, these text to image prompts and said, okay, I'm going to uh, type in the Baltimore Orioles, uh, which is a football team. Um, and <laughs> it, baseball team, it, baseball team, <laughs> sports. Uh, so it, it generates some sports guys. Um, but also some of the time it starts generating um, birds. So there's also Baltimore Orioles. And so she starts poking it and seeing like, okay, um, if I say Baltimore Orioles in a supermarket, does it put in the baseball team or a bunch of birds? Uh, Baltimore Orioles eating bread, which one is it, does it start picking? And starts kind of teasing apart, like, how does it, how does it compress the entirety of the words Baltimore Orioles um, into kind of one thing? And she discovers that regardless of which Orioles it pulls in, it starts putting a lot of oranges around them. And that like their color is orange, um, but then it turns out that Baltimore, like the Orioles like to eat oranges. And so there's something that has so compressed the idea of oranges with this bird, with this football team, that even if you ask for the football team, it'll start putting oranges around them. Um, and so there are these this kind of averaging things out in ways that often we don't expect. So you, her, her argument was possibly in the future, you're gonna start seeing weird things show up in descriptions of you because they're brought in from things that this machine has accidentally averaged with you. Um, Kate Compton is uh, also a Northwestern um, drama student and also uh, one of the most prolific nude models in England. Um, so I suspect that I'm probably gonna get a lot of really weird stuff when this algorithm starts trying to do predictions on who Kate Compton is. Um, and so yeah, these are, these are kind of people uh, using AI to investigate itself, which I think is very interesting. I do. Um, I can give an example as well um, on uh, a Japanese artist. Um, she's a British 
a, a British Japanese artist called Sputiko, and he was already a friend of hers. But um, <laughs> she recently uh, had this question: Can menstruation exist in the metaverse? And so she she she's created this really cool um, artwork a few years back called the Menstruation Machine, where anybody can and have this experience of having a menstruation. So it's this kind of um, um, device that you put on. And um, and it's meant to be an art piece. But she decided to use that and say to one metaverse company, um, I'd like to introduce a, a menstrual machine app to be used in with your users. And so she sent that in, and it got rejected. And so that whole experience of creating mm -hmm. that device and then uh, the app and then it being rejected became the art piece. And so it's a critique on how uh, the metaverse is being shaped by men and that demonstration is not supposed to exist and how uh, gender is supposed to disappear. Great. Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, my name is Scott. Um, so I was curious about the role of the art of press in this. What should the press be communicating with the most important of uh, the information itself? And how well are they doing in that? And how, how far are they going? I'm going to put that question to Kauri because she's our comms person. You know, the question was, what is the role of the popular press? What should they be communicating around this and how well are they doing? Popular press like tabloids, yeah. or just tabloids? newspapers in general, newspapers, media, CNN, Asad, Ichimun, oh. you know. Yeah. Uh, they are struggling. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In, also in Japan, we have five big national newspapers. Uh, they send still millions of copies a day, but uh, only the, I think, people about 50. <laughs> Only subscribe to this type of newspaper. They subscribe the papers still, but they are disappearing. So the role of the newspapers now is give the public sphere, the institutional and also more or less professional news, but not give papers. So that's the big difference because they sold paper. They used to sell papers, but now they sell. They try to sell news, but in order to get news, it costs quite much. So they have to sell. They have to have a business model to sustain the good news. Uh, to, to have a good news activity, but that's very very difficult. Uh, in the, at the time at the age of the news uh, uh, digitization. Young people don't subscribe to any news anymore. They but don't how do you pay. feel they're communicating about AI? Which AI? Yeah. Your, the question was, how do you feel journalists should be talking or educating the public around these issues? Is that correct? Yeah. Journalists uh, make the public understand about AI? Hmm. I think they don't really... Journalists themselves have to have to first learn about the AI. What's the best thing to communicate? What should they communicate? If you were telling a newspaper what to write about, what would you say? I think I, I, I'm not so sure, but the AI is something that we don't see, right? It's all behind uh, everything, mm -hmm. and it's everywhere now. You you use your smartphone every day and automatically your data will be uh, uh, go to any somewhere and use for it, uh, the AI as we said that uh, the will be the uh, one of the big data so I think the news institutions should make the public aware what they are what the public are doing with their smartphone and how it is con connected to the AI uh, AI uh, systems. Uh, and uh, it's not that so simple that every every activity is, and every activity what we do, every every data we put in in our computer may be used. Uh, by any some other party, and that should be made aware. 
maybe by the community situation. I, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Education. Making visible what's invisible. Basically. Yes, yes. Exactly. So we have only five minutes, and let me, before I ask the last question, let me just tell everyone that we're just going to break from the formal program, but there's wine and cheese out there and an opportunity for us to continue the conversation informally with everyone here. So please. Join us as we finish. Um, so just to close, I want to ask all of you, um, um, what do you see, we're all from universities, so what do you see as the role of universities? The question was about journalism, but what about universities? What is the role of universities at this moment in this work? And how can collaboration between universities, maybe between Northwestern and the University of Tokyo, for example, um, be a force for um, for for good at this moment? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I can talk a little bit just very briefly about what I've been doing at Northwestern uh, as kind of my personal eyes to drive, um, which is I think that uh, programming does not belong to the departments uh, any more than writing belongs to literature departments. Uh, I think it's a tool that everyone needs. Uh, it is getting used on everyone. Uh, and kind of as part of this like ownership, you need to be able to own these means of production and these like algorithms that are getting used on you and be able to, everyone in our journalism school should know a little bit of Python and should be able to make a Twitter bot and everybody in the medical school should be able to do that. Uh, so I've been reworking one of the classes at Northwestern and CS150 just technically our second class and come in with no programming experience to take 110 or 111 and then 150. But I really, uh, so it was made when I first got here in 2020. Um, I really took ownership of it because the pandemic's a great time to just do things without permission. Um, and so I said, okay, look, I'm gonna make this, uh, there's there's a, a great book called Unlocking the Clubhouse, which is about um, figuring out that women uh, in, in computer science at Cardin Mill and we're just pairing in 2000. Um, and they interviewed all the women who went through computer science and to figure it out. And basically the ones, uh, the TLDR, the whole book is uh, people who said, um, who agree with the statement, CS is a particular gift and you either have it or you don't, drop it out immediately. Um, because the first time you get a, an error, which you get all the time, that's just how computers talk to you. Uh, you realize that you are not destined to be a computer scientist, so you drop out. But the people who said that like, oh, it's just a, a skill and you get good at the skill, um, they all actually stayed in. Uh, so I've been trying to like do that with my students. But as part of that, I've also said, okay, this clubhouse, when we say like, oh, everybody should come into STEM, we need to fund more STEM, get everybody into STEM, get them to drop out of art and drop out of ballet and like come over to computer science. That's ridiculous. Um, what we need to do is actually like bring, uh, so I, I describe it instead of as a clubhouse, you can come into the clubhouse, certainly you're welcome. I'm happy to have you in the degree, uh, but you can also just get this as a takeout class. Uh, you can come to my window, you can get enough Python to go, like you should never have, if, you have, if anybody ever gives you 600 PDFs and tells you to scrape data out of them by tomorrow morning, you should say, yeah, sure, that's no problem. Uh, <laughs> from having gone through this class in 10 weeks. Um, come join my class if you've ever had to like scrape through 600 PDFs. Um, and so everybody should have at Northwestern or at any university that level of literacy. And that's kind of the axe that I want to grind. We'll see how many students I can eventually take, um, but I think that like that's kind of what we need for literacy. Like we can't have people who go through university and can't read books that were written about their field. We can't have people that are going to have to deal with algorithms that are impacting them and can't speak to one of those algorithms or doing at least at a rudimentary like ten years level. Okay, I need to sign up. That's <laughs> All right. Other thoughts? University? Public university? Uh, sorry. As I said, uh, the University of Tokyo has the 150 year uh, tradition. And through the development of my university, engineering faculty was the uh, driving force of the, our university. And it has been our belief that engineering make our, makes our society happier in a way, well, wealthier in a way, yes. And the, makes the Japan also the wealthier. And this uh, kind of idea or thought is deep uh, rooted in our institution. And now with AI, we have to be also, as I said, we have to be careful because AI is behind all the all our daily lives. So as you both said, critical thinking. We need to now think technologies a little bit more critically so that we can make 
all the we can't think all the technology something that made us wealthier or happier we have to think it think a little bit more critically and more little bit more with ethics so that's the, i think the role of the university now or academic institution to make the public aware that we need uh, ethics uh, when we develop uh, technologies that's uh, I think so, this is a university can, as we talked uh, before, university can be a good institution to make this, uh, to give this thought to the wider public. Absolutely. So we've got two interesting ideas educate everybody <laughs> and uh, a space for more critical thinking. Um, anything else? Um, I just I think marrying the two ideas and saying that um, critical AI studies across the curriculum for like liberal arts curriculum so that everybody gets a chance to to think about the social implications of AI. Um, there's some really great research hubs already at like the NYU and Stanford when it comes to human centered AI or AI for social justice. But um, somehow making sure that there's not those uh, those centers. Um, Great, uh, more nods, I suppose, is something that we can think about. So, you yeah, know, more global. Exactly. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. That works absolutely. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, we often say at Buffett that one of the things that's great about universities is we can take the long run too, not just think about this moment, but think about mm -hmm. the, the longer picture and even future generations and how this impacts in the future. So, perhaps that's another piece. Well, this is great. Well, listen. Let's give our panel a round of applause. Great, right. this kind of conversation that we really love in Buffett, where we can bring together scholars from different parts of the world to think about really critical questions together. So let's continue out there. Please, everybody, stay around for a drink and uh, to meet our panel. Thank you. Thank you.